Hello, everyone. I think uh, now everyone uh, is here uh, attending. Now, first of all, thank you for taking your time to join us uh, today's uh, webinar. If you don't know me, my name is Ivana Milanovic and I work as a project coordinator here at European Schoolnet. So we are a, a network of ministries of education and we're based in Brussels. Today, Brussels is a bit gloomy. I hope where you're joining us, it's a bit, a bit sunnier. Uh, so I will give uh, the floor now to our lovely speakers, Michael and uh, Kalina, to introduce themselves and to tell you a bit about this webinar today. Excellent. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having us here. It's uh, great to be back for another webinar. Oh, I didn't share the slides yet, did I? No, didn't. Okay. And so just as I'm loading up my slides, uh, if anyone who wants to can say hi in the chat and say where you're joining from, because it's always exciting to see uh, where everyone's joining us from. Uh, now you should be seeing my slides if everything's going okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'm Michael Gregory. You'll see uh, um, nicknames that AI gave us here that we'll explain. <laughs> and this is... <laughs> Yeah, hello everyone from me. I'm Kalina, or the one to read encyclopedias, as our little AI tool called me. And yeah, with Michael Outreach Man today, we are going to show you how to harness the power of AI with some very nice tools that we're going to tell you more about and the cool things that we plan to do in the future. So to introduce ourselves a bit, um, I'm no stranger to scientists. You might remember me from some of my past recent experiences. Another fun thing I like to do at the start of one of these is ask if you recognize me from somewhere. And a lot of you might not. This might be the first time a lot of you are seeing me, which is perfectly normal. But if you've seen me before somewhere interesting or fun, share in the chat where the last interesting place you saw me was, because uh, that, that can be fun to see. Uh, and Kalina, your past <laughs> scientific experiences? Yeah. Well, uh, I don't think that the next slide is, yeah, it's visible now. So, yeah, uh, the list of my past scientific uh, appearances is quite different than Michael's because this is the first time I appear. So this slide will look very different for the next time I hope to see you. I really do. So, yeah, nice to meet you all. I'm Kalina and, uh, yeah, I'm a particle physicist from Sofia University in Bulgaria. And uh, for my work with particle physics, I actually got to work with artificial intelligence. So because of this, this is how we two actually met. And maybe it's now better to go to not Michael or Kalina, but Michael and Kalina. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are together uh, back in Sofia, where we first met, and back in the Faculty of Physics in Sofia, where we first met. Although, was that auditorium in the chemistry faculty or was it? No, it was here. Okay, it was here. So back, back in the faculty of physics, we, we met a year ago. I was uh, touring around Europe, uh, putting together a science show on particle physics, particle detectives, which I mentioned in my last Scientix webinar, um, particle physics for teachers. And uh, we met there and stayed in touch. And in the spring, when I started, well, when I was about to start working for the European Physical Society on discovery space and needed to learn a bit about artificial intelligence, then just like I do anytime I learn, I need to learn about something new, I seek out world class <laughs> experts. <laughs> Thank you. Learn from them and then come up with some way of sharing that with the teaching community uh, in general. So that's, that's kind of what we're doing here. And we actually came up with the idea of something that we call AIM Low, <coughs> which is quite an interesting abbreviation, but uh, it doesn't stand for <laughs> AIMing Low. It stands for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Online Workshop. And actually, yeah, the idea, the idea is to join forces of a teacher and a scientist in order to help teachers learn more about artificial intelligence, how to apply it in their classrooms, how to recognize when it is used, but also to just know more about how AI works. Because I think that nowadays, everyone uses artificial intelligence one way or another. And people really need to know more about this stuff so they can use it properly. And, and one, one of the things that came up when we first started talking about this and coming up with ideas together, we didn't yet have the idea of presenting a webinar together, presenting a course. And as we started to have more interesting things, we started saying, this seems interesting. This is worth sharing with more people. 
uh, let's do a webinar. And then we thought, oh, we've got more content for just one thing. Let's do like a two part thing. And eventually it turned into a six part course, um, which we're starting next week. But this webinar should hopefully give you a taste of what's to come, but also some ideas that might be interested, interesting, whether or not you end up interested in following up more with it. Um, so with, with that, I think let's get to the first thing we're going to do. So this will be slightly interactive. We're kind of limited to you guys interacting through the chat. Um, but in the chat, please type the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about artificial intelligence. And we'll, we'll give it a couple of seconds to see uh, what comes through. What do you think of when you hear artificial intelligence? <clears throat> so that's a very good first yeah. <laughs> one we got there, uh, chat GPT. Uh, and that, that's one we're going to talk a lot about. Oh, no, a number wow. of good ones. Yeah. Data processing, machine learning, prompts, future. Yeah. Oh, th those are good ones too. Okay. And we, we see there's more than one. And the very first response was chat GPT. <laughs> yeah. So that's good that our next slide is about language models. Yeah, but <laughs> no. first tell me what is the first thing that you think about when you hear about artificial intelligence? Oh, I, <laughs> I, I think of uh, baby GTP, which we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about. Yeah, okay, uh, we'll talk about them. this uh, in uh, a while. But uh, okay, so chat GPT, uh, yeah, many people nowadays associate chat GPT with artificial intelligence. And actually, very, very often, like when I talk to people, I hear that when someone doesn't know something, they say, I will ask chat GPT. And just a few years ago, when we didn't have chat GPT, that used to be, I will ask Google, remember? And from asking Google, everyone went to asking chat GPT. But this is like two very, very different things. And by the way, in the chat, I also see many more very interesting replies. I saw neural networks, machine learning, and all this kind of stuff, which is great because actually chat GPT and many of the other IT tools are actually built on that. But first things first, let's get to the first thing that we want to talk about today, which is uh, large language models. One of which, the most famous of which is chat GPT that we all ask <laughs> for us things. And, and just on the idea of if you don't know something, ask chat G, uh, GP, G, G, <laughs> I, I ask some kind of chat thing or ask Google, mind if I don't know something, I'll seek out a world class expert <laughs> and learn from them. Uh, but also, I had a lot of friends back when I was teaching, like in the science department, if they don't know something, ask Michael about it. And so, asking other people, that's something we shouldn't lose track of. Uh, people are often the most valuable source. Uh, of learning and as teachers, I'm sure all of you can appreciate that as well. Yeah, so very quick something on large language models, which ChatGPT is a very good example of. And uh, I think that most of the people have actually like used ChatGPT or something like that, something similar because it's not the only one nowadays. And uh, the thing is that we are talking to it. And what we do not realize is that ChatGPT doesn't know things. And large language models are actually what uh, one of the main types of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And it is called unsupervised, or in ChatGPT's case, self-supervised learning. And I want to introduce a little bit of uh, machine learning knowledge here. And how exactly do we train things? And how exactly do we create artificial intelligence? So the thing is that we, we can have two types of learning. One is what you see here on the slide is unsupervised. And the other thing we call supervised learning. And the difference between this uh, is very simple. And we can illustrate this with actually how you would teach a concept to a child. You have uh, basically two, two possibilities. You can give a number of objects to a child and associate each object with a name. This is a table, a table looks like this, and this is a chair, and the chair looks like this. This would be supervised learning, because you tell the child or your neural network what is what, what is called what. But then unsupervised learning is actually, you do not name the things, you do not tell them the concepts. You give the 
child a chair and a table and you hope that they learn that they have to sit on the chair and use the table, for example, to, to, to write their homework or, or to eat. And that is done through trial and error. And actually, in a bit, we're going to train something similar on a text. And this is going to be like an example of the same thing. Large language models, they, uh, sh they see very, very big amounts of text, of data, and they learn how the words are ordered. They learn how frequently a certain word comes after another and so on. And this is done on huge, huge amounts of text. So when you ask ChatGPT something and it gives you an answer, it really just generates a chain of words. And this chain of words, they have no meaning to it. So it doesn't know right from wrong or something like that. And it just gets better and better because it's a more complex model trained on more data. But and then once again, it lacks self-awareness. So can you change a little bit for a little example that we did? Uh, so there is ChatGPT, but as we said, there's also many other types of large language models. For example, there is uh, one uh, developed in Bulgaria by the uh, by some Bulgarian scientist that's called BGGTP, and this essentially does the same job, but it's a different model. There are many more. And uh, you see a screenshot of uh, actually a conversation we had with Chat GPT about the different other options. And yeah. Well, and, and like to, to put that into a bit of context as well, when we were thinking of how to explain how a language model works, we thought it could be useful if we try and trip it up, get it to give weird output, get it to give weird errors. And it's easier to do that on a more limited language model. So we knew that BGGPT was newer, but also had less development power behind it, was trained on smaller data. So we could expect more weird things to, yeah. to go out of it. At, at the same time, and as you can see while I'm talking about it, I keep confusing the order of letters, GPT, GTP, <laughs> so on. And so we decided to ask it about these different ones. And if there are, different ones with different arrangements of the acronym, either made by people trying to rip off a legitimate one, and to ask about BGGTP and BGGPT. Uh, and when it answered, of course, the training data it was presented with was the internet or what was available online before it was created, because it wasn't trained on the internet once it existed. So there was absolutely nothing in its training data that referred to itself. So it answered that BGGPT uh, probably doesn't exist. Um, and and that, that was what BGG, <laughs> that one. Would, like, so it, it wasn't aware of its own existence. Yeah. And you'll, you'll find that kind of error time and time again with chat GPT yeah. as well. If you're asking it any questions about itself, it'll usually be wrong. Yeah. So this all motivated us to see how exactly we can explore language models. And if we can actually teach people to use them and why not develop them if someone is interested in developing those. So uh, we decided to create our very own small language model. So if an LLM is a large language model, baby GTP, is an SLM, it's a very, very small <laughs> language model. But uh, yeah, we uh, created this to demonstrate how, how they work and actually to show people how artificial intelligence is trained real time. Now, the thing is that uh, all of these things uh, take chat GPT, take any AI tool that you can use they are trained on incredibly big amounts of data. You, you cannot even imagine how, how big they are. And they use uh, a lot of computing power. And we were aiming for something that we can train on, on a normal person's like personal computer. So it's very primitive, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a good thing because uh, in order to learn how complex things work, you have to start from something quite simple. Well, and, and back to the idea that often errors are more instructional than something working well. The goal of baby GTP isn't to have useful output. 
It's to have output that's nonsensical, but nonsensical in instructive ways that help explain how a language model works. Uh, it also came up kind of with the idea, back when I was a kid, I'd heard about a Japanese person who had learned English by studying Shakespeare. And then they went to visit the United States and they came speaking Shakespeare in English. And it seemed like utter nonsense. And I was thinking, if we train a language model with only Shakespeare, or we did it with Huckleberry Finn, which is a very famous 19th century American uh, novel, then you get output that's kind of like the dialogue you'd get in Huckleberry Finn. Um, similarly, like we have ideas to train it based on Wikipedia, then any output would be kind of encyclopedia style. And one of the cool things about this, because it's taking input text, and it's just pairing what's the most probable next word, then the next word after that, and building up from that, you can input text independent of language. So although most of what we trained it on is English, it came up when I was putting something in French. We, we did at least yeah. one French thing, yeah. yeah. Um, and you can use any language and it, it'll work just fine because the same principle, well, sometimes accents, and there's a lot of apostrophes in, apostrophes in French. So. French becomes slightly more of a hassle, but other than that, it, it works for any language you want to train it on. Yeah, but uh, that's a that's a very like natural thing because whether it processes languages, whether it processes images, any type of information, it all like any machine learning, <clears throat> artificial intelligence, or whatever model you take, actually turns uh, things into numbers and works with numbers. So in a sense, it is not even aware that these are different languages. For it, these are just words composed of letters and that's all. So uh, yeah, and now a very quick demonstration of this baby GTP thing. By the way, before we proceed, just so you know that GTP is actually <laughs> a wrong way to spell GPT, which means generative pre-trained transformer. But as Michael would m mix up the letters, we decided to keep it with GTP <laughs> as a way to make it our own and uh, yeah, to, to have it unique. So now I'm going to share my screen and so, I am actually going to show you real time. How, how to teach the baby to talk. Yeah, exactly. And for that uh, reason, we are going to use uh, a song. And very quickly in the chat, uh, can you please tell us if you know the song American Pie by Don McLean? And mm. yeah, so let's see. Do you know? Oh, there's a thumbs up. There's even like a, a reaction <laughs> icon. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I'm going to react. So there's at least a second thumbs up there. <laughs> okay, and we're, we're getting a couple of no's. So then the next chunk depends a little bit on having a familiarity with the song no, not that much in principle so kalina can you sing the song for us oh no I, i'm a very bad singer <laughs> no you don't want to hear that but uh it doesn't matter the the song the particular song uh what uh, we're starting with is that we are going to use uh some piece of text and for the sake of doing this quickly, we're going to use a small piece of text, which is the length of a song. By the way, American Pie is an incredibly long song, <laughs> but, but still nowhere near the length of a book. And the reason for this is that the longer the text we use for training, the more time it will get. So we're going to use something smaller. Um, so yeah, the whole idea of what we're going to do is that we have developed a very simple model. And what I mean by model, this is the way that the algorithm goes through the data. And this can be in various ways. So what we are going to demonstrate here is a simple neural network. Neural networks are a type of machine learning, which is a type of artificial intelligence. And basically most of the artificial intelligence nowadays that is done for scientific data and for other stuff is neural networks. And and this is a very simple neural network. And as the name suggests, for the ones who are not familiar with neural networks, the idea of these algorithms comes from the way the neurons in our brains are connected and the way that they process information so that we people learn things. And 
learn to distinguish things and the way our vision also is connected with our brain. And I'll get back to this uh, later. But yeah, we have a neural network and now we're going to train it, giving it a text. So, okay, I have a bit of a technical issue that I will have to stop my share for, for a moment for. Do, do you not need time to sort it out? You want me to go on to a next yeah, thing? Yeah, uh, please go on and we'll back. Okay, we'll back. so I'll, I'll, I'll take over sharing my slides again. Um, here we go. Okay, so we'll get back to training it. But one of the most basic building blocks of any language model is predictive ch text generation. And I was thinking of a way to model this in a classroom activity so you could teach students about it. And the simplest way to do that is to take a simple text. So again, we took the song American Pie. So if you're not familiar, you can study all the lyrics here. And just in a, a, a word processor, uh, searched for words in the song, and then looked at the next word after that, put the next word after that, and then looked for that string and saw the number of occurrences in it. So in the case of American Pie, the occurs 75 times. The most common word after it is day. And by searching in this method, I have it appears 19 times, the day. Uh, and I started doing a tally like this. And I was doing that partly because to get students to do it so they can understand what a model is doing, it's good to break it down to small pieces. Also going through an activity like this, they get pretty quickly to the point where they say, it's kind of annoying to do this step by step. Can't we have it automated? I was in exactly that spot a night before a presentation two weeks ago when I was premiering a game I call Overfit the Game, we call Overfit the Game, that we'll play in just a minute. And I was telling this to Kalina and she said, oh yeah, I can write a program for that. And I said, but you're busy tonight. And she said, yeah, but don't worry, I'll, I'll get it done. So that same night she wrote a program uh, and she sent me how to do it with like instructions, press play here, your result is here. <laughs> and so that, that's yeah. one of the advantages of teaming up with someone who's really good at this kind of thing. I can say, I know this could be coded, I've never really gotten around to teach myself how to code well enough to like that it's worth my time to do that because it would take me hours to figure out. I'm just like, no, I got it covered. And so now it's a slightly automated version. Um, is the more automated version ready to run yes, again? Yes, yes. Uh, Perfect. So yeah, once again, changing the screen share. So the whole purpose of this is to really show, okay, you can hopefully see my screen now yeah you can so yeah the whole yes. purpose of what we're doing is uh to really show through language models how actually what we teach ai and machine learning and all of this that stands behind this is to really be able to find patterns in a text and we say the word train and teach a lot. And this is what we're going to do right now. I'm going to run the program. And uh, yeah, I'm going to use the song lyrics. And just uh, as I'm typing the, the file name, I will ask Michael to just recite the beginning of the song so that you get an idea for the ones who haven't listened to it, to recite the, like the first two, three uh, verses just so that you have an idea of how the text that we are training our model sounds like. So I, I didn't know I was signing up to sing. But <laughs> you so may not go, sing, okay. you may A long, long time ago, and I can still remember how the music used to make me smile. Yeah. Smile? <laughs> and do I need to keep going? Okay, this is enough. Yeah, a long, long time ago, I can still remember how the music, music used, used to, to make me smile. And I knew if I had the chance that I, I could make, make the people, people dance, dance and they'd be happy for a while. It's a beautiful song. So yeah, I have the song lyrics, like the whole song loaded, uh, written in a text file that I'm just going to uh, say that I want this one. We have a couple of different models. And now we come to the interesting part when we train things we actually want to know for how long do we want to train them for example if i'm showing someone images of things and i want them to remember what's where um for example i show you a cat a dog a rabbit and a horse 
if I show them to you only once, there's a good chance you may forget what is what. But if I show you all the pictures five times, then see, seeing something five times is better than seeing it only once. You will definitely remember it better if you've seen it more times. And that's what, when we train neural networks, we call epochs. How many times are we going to show this data that we're training on to the model? And right now, I want to show you the difference that, have, that, that we have between training something for like 10 epochs, showing it 10 times, showing it 100, and showing it 200. And we're going to have a difference in the outcome. So let's start with only 10 times. Only 10 times I am showing the lyrics of the song to our little model. And you can see live here 10 times. OK, so now it has learned. And just to remind you, a long, long time ago, I could still remember how that music used to make me smile. This is how the text starts. And I will now <clears throat> feed a seed to it. I will tell it what I wanted to start with. Think of it, the ones who use ChatGPT, think of that as the prompt that you're giving it. But as I said, our code is a little bit more primitive, so it needs a seed. And I'm going to start with along. How many sentences do I want? Let's start with one. Let, let's keep them two because it gets confused about sentences. And basically, you see this along the, 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 the. And the reason for this is that basically our model didn't have any time to learn and it got stuck on a single word like it cannot possibly predict what happens next so now i'm going to repeat the very same process and try to remember what happened here so i'm going to repeat the very same process but this time i'm going to train it on a hundred epochs and what you see here on my screen it says loss accuracy basically the accuracy tells you explain that as it's training so yeah no okay yeah so basically, the accuracy tells you how accurately it tries to predict stuff as it trains. So you see that it's pretty quick. That's because I'm actually not training it on my computer, but on a faster machine. But basically, for 100 epochs, we have a 0.5 arc accuracy. And one is obviously <clears throat> the ultimate thing. So the seed will again be the beginning of the song and it's a long, we again want two sentences. And just to remind you, we had a long duh, 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 for the previous one. So now when we have it generated, see what we have. So it starts with um, a long and the, and the music on the book, the and cast, and it got stuck in a loop of well, real slow, which is part yeah. of the song. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So however, you see that it no longer just repeats the same word. Now it has learned something. It can put a few words together. And it took longer to get trapped in the loop as well. Yeah. Think of that as a child learning to speak. Basically, children can only say a couple words when, once mm. uh, they start speaking. But then the more, the, the more and more they learn, the more and better sentences they start constructing. So we're going to do this one last time. And this time, I'm going to run it for 200 epochs. And you can check this accuracy parameter. It gets stuck on a number, but then it gets unstuck really quick. And you can see how it evolves and it gets a higher and higher value with the training. And for 200 epochs, we were able to get it as high as 0 0.82, which is quite good. So entering the seed again, uh, we again want two sentences. And let's see what we get. See, we now have a long time, one high and laugh in your mortal without more, more the world and so on and so on. You can, mm. you can all read it, the whole thing if you want, but you can see <clears> how <throat> it becomes more and more to look like sentences. Like we can't go on much further with that. And the reason for this is that we just have a very small amount of text that mm. we're training it on, but you saw how the, the more training you have, the more epochs you give it, or the more times you show it, the more it learns how the words exactly go in sentences. So this was just a little demonstration of training language models. <laughs> so yeah, maybe I should stop sharing now and give the floor back to Michael. 
because uh, yeah, we <clears throat> saw how a computer does it. And, and now let's see how people do it. So we're going to play a game called Overfit the Game. Uh, and awkwardly, just the functionality, we haven't bothered making something except, exceptionally pretty for this yet. And so I'm going to get out of presentation mode. You'll still see the overfit the game. And unfortunately, you kind of see my slides over to the side. But that's so I can edit it just for like how the gameplay works. So to play this game, you'll be answering in the chat. And you need to predict what you think the next word in the song would be. Obviously, this is easy if you know the song. Feel free to look up the lyrics online. People have sent links through the chat. And thank you for sending that. So. If you think you know what word might uh, come after the word buy in the song, and the chorus goes, bye, bye, Miss American, bye. So, I mean, that, that gives you a big hint what one of the next words would be. But in the chat, please guess what you think the most common next word after buy would be. Even if you don't know the song, <clears throat> it's pretty easy to guess what comes after buy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we're waiting for your guesses in the chat. No one dares to guess. It's either because of a delay or a lag or people are really actually scared of getting this wrong. <laughs> yes, bye, okay. So let's see if buy is up on the scoreboard and buy is number one. So of the 14 occurrences of the word buy in the song, seven of them are followed by buy. So it would be buy, buy. Is there any other word that might follow the word buy? Miss, exactly. So the other seven occurrences yeah. are followed by the word uh, miss. And so in a language model, then it's looking at when it sees the word by, there's a 50-50 chance where the next word should be by or should be miss. So if you don't have anything other than next word prediction, which that's a horrible thing for a language model. So the, like the baby GPT does a bit more than that. But if it was only that, it would only predict by or miss after the seed word by, and then get stuck in a loop of either by, 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 or by, miss, by, miss, by, miss, by, miss because those are the only uh, options there. Uh, there's several more rounds of the game we could play, but I'm going to skip to the most complicated full one, the word the, which is the most common word in the whole song. Are there any guesses for frequent words that might follow the word uh, the in American Pie? The day. Yes, the day is the most common one. The day the music died. Day occurs. 19 times. Any other guesses what might be other words? And I, I already said one. Limit? Limit? Does not appear. Well, it does not appear more than once. I only have scored once that appear two times or more. Because there's five, six different words that appear with a frequency of two or greater. Any other guesses for the music? Yes, yeah. the music is the third most common, and I had two things blocked. Sorry, it's me. <laughs> you, 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 one of us deleted music. It, 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 one of us only needs to drive this thing. M music, yeah. music. Okay. I have this open somewhere it's else. You, okay, it's you. okay. So we already deleted it, but that, that is music. M music occurs ten times. Levy appears eleven times. Uh, the jester sang for the king and queen. The jester appears three times. And the king uh, and players uh, appear two times. So that's kind of like the inner first principles of how a language model could work. Um, if we go to where we're going with this, and we'll skip through some of this, because we don't have that much time left, and we have a handful of other things we want to go through. But a probability tree like this distributing, and that's, oh, and I'll go to slideshow mode again, because we, um, so I'm just going to zoom in on this part for the next slide. So following the word the, this is a tree of the occurrences. So we saw the day appeared 19 times, 
the music was somewhere else on the tree. The day the music died appears six out of the, those times. So of the 19, we have the music died and the day that I, so the 13 and six is 19. And a language model would be constructed bigger than this. Oh, of course. Um, other thoughts on this before our image? Because we, we have a couple more things to do, so we don't want to spend too long on this. I'm okay yeah. to move on? Yes, we are oh, okay. okay to move on. Okay, so <laughs> a, a, a fun thing, just the last thing with predictive text generation is uh, the, one of the simplest examples, it'll be familiar with th things, is if you type in a search bar and it predicts the next word. So that's usually predicting mainly based on frequency of searches, but with some other different things. So I tried searching, why is Michael Gregory so? And it gave me the answer is famous and popular. <laughs> Kalina tried the same thing. When she got to the ask, why is Michael Gregory still alive? And why is Michael Gregory so bad or so expensive? <laughs> so we want to see what you come up with. So open a search bar somewhere in the background. If you can do that without losing to the webinar and type in, why is Michael Gregory so? And if you have any interesting uh, auto-completes or like search suggestions, then share those in the chat. And these will be reasonably regionally in, independent. Reasonably, there will be a dependency on a lot of things, including where you are, but not just that. Um, we won't get into everything it could depend on, but we, you might get, oh, so fair. OK, not only the one, OK, so good. So, yeah, obviously, just in my region, you're not very well liked. <laughs> so, so hot. Sophia, okay. Yeah, you're in Sofia now. Yeah. Oh, these are I, all very good. Yeah. <laughs> I like those. Well, not but... a single person got still alive. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, still alive, okay. So hate it. <laughs> See, it might turn. Yeah. And it, it it could be interesting to try and compare where each of these come from. Maybe yeah. we'll do that in AIMLO if we do something yeah. similar. Yeah. Uh because we don't we, we don't have time. If you have more ones, keep adding them because they're amusing to see as we uh go on. But now yeah. it's time to talk briefly about uh images. Yes, because we talked a lot about text and that's normal text generation by AI is uh, widely used. But then the other main thing about artificial intelligence recently has been images. So very quickly, I want to, to show you just uh, the, the three things that we can have when we talk about artificial intelligence and image data. So we can have image generation and this uh, actually this photo that I've shown there is a recent case of people like spreading it and saying, look at this beautiful mountain and how it looks like a, a lying woman and something. But that's actually created with AI. And um, so, yeah, that co could be very good. And this is one of the cases where artificial intelligence, neural networks, machine learning and all of this kind, kind of stuff can be used to generate things. So in a sense, the image generation is has quite the same principle as text generation. Then you could also have image manipulation when uh, you have like, for example, a blurry image or something like that. Many people have it on, in their phones already that they have like AI enhanced uh, image manipulation uh, programs in their phones. So this is also something that can be done, but maybe like the most educational one is image recognition. And what you see here is um, a screenshot of something else we developed for AIMLOW which is a very simple classifier, again, a neural network, which uh, classifies, yeah, you can, uh, thank you, which classifies dogs and cat images. So basically we give it 1,000 dog images and say, this is a dog and 1,000 cat images, this is a cat. And moreover, we created what we call a saliency map because when we teach about artificial intelligence, it's very important not to teach what it can do, of course, that's important, but more importantly, why it does that. And saliency maps are some part of uh, explainable AI in the sense that, okay, our network tells us that on this image, we have a dog, but we ask the question why. And what you see here with this like red and uh, yellow heat map things on the two right uh, images is which parts of the dog and of the cat actually are the most important for the network to say that this is a dog or this is a cat. 
So uh, in, a, in a sense, this tells us what exactly the algorithm as features learns in dogs and cats in order to be able to distinguish them. And you can see that, that like the, the hotspots are their heads, their eyes, their ears, which is, and also the length of the dog's legs, by the way. So, which really shows us that in a way we do this with our eyes, when we see a dog and a cat, we distinguish them by certain features they have. And what this shows us is how to do it with artificial intelligence. And I want to show you a very cool teaching tool, uh, which I have put the link on the slide, but I think that you will also get the link, which is a much more, uh, much better developed version of what I already saw you. So you have this picture of a cute little dog and a cat. And actually, when you pass it to a computer and ask it what is there, what the computer sees is what you see on the right. <laughs> so, yeah, this is how a neural network would go uh, around the picture. And it will take the, the different parts of it and filter them and make diff different calculations. And actually, it's a much more complicated process. If you please skip to the next slide. You can see that this is done in uh, many, many different repetitions. But essentially, what it does is that it takes the dog and the cat from this image. You can see the leftmost uh, one on your screens resembles the original image the most. And it starts to sort of compress them into like a smaller and smaller number of more important features in order to, to be kind of able to, to distinguish them. But a really a take home message is that, OK, we do have like a network that separates dogs and cats. But uh, what if we give it an image of a rabbit? It won't say it's a rabbit because our algorithms only know what we teach them. And if we have an AI that is taught to distinguish dogs from cats and you give it a picture of a rabbit, it will say it's either a dog or a cat. So. Artificial intelligence is only as good as we humans make it. And you, and you can play fun games with that. And, and we'll, we'll do that a little bit in our upcoming course, Aim Love. But uh, you could train it on dogs and cats and then take pictures of people and have it say whether that person looks more like a dog mm. or like a cat, yeah. uh, according to the algorithm <laughs> you put. So there, like, there are fun ways to teach kids about this too. And if you're interested in more fun ways to teach kids about this, uh, then please join our uh, six week long course starting on Tuesday, every Tuesday, going over different topics of artificial intelligence. So that's one of two invitations we're finishing off with here. This one, you can sign up at the end of the webinar. We'll send a link to it. Hopefully you'll be interested in joining. Uh, the other invitation is a really exciting project that I'm actually the brand new uh, European Fiscal Society EU project officer for the project discovery space. Uh, there's a bit of text there that goes over in a, a bit of detail. Uh, we, I'll just go over it verbally. We've got a number of project partners across Europe, which are responsible for developing different parts of it. It fits together kind of like pieces of a big puzzle, but most of us are also responsible for developing training locally in our own country. So if you're in the same country as one of these partners, they're probably going to be running training in person in your country in the coming year, uh, kind of all around Europe and all online. I'm in charge of the training academy, uh, the European Physical Society. But briefly, in case it's in, of interest, if they're in the same country as you, uh, Bayreuth University, even though it sounds like Beirut in Lebanon, it's actually a university in, uh, in, in Germany. I, thinking that Bayern is uh, Bavaria, in, in Bavaria. Uh, Duesto and Labsland are both in Bilbao in Spain. Uh, these three are all in Athens or the Athens area. Uh, Nucleos in Portugal. EPS is based in Malouz, France, but it's really a European-wide network, which is my focus isn't just France, although I'll be running things in France in French as well. Um, I think we're pretty low on time, so I need to go pretty quick with these. But the basic idea of what Discovery Space is, is it's a, a platform that uses the power of artificial intelligence to guide students through individualized learning pathways through an inquiry investigation. So there's different learning scenarios that cover different topics. One that I'm piloting this weekend in Sofia with a group of teachers at Technomagic Land 
if you're near Sofia, it's not too late to sign up if you want to join us, uh, is on the magic of refraction. So a couple of magic themed experiments uh, that teach students about refraction, but there's ones on all kinds of different topics that are already developed and being developed as we go. Later on, once, um, once it's easier to produce learning scenarios, because all of this is being produced for the project. Uh, once it gets easier to produce learning uh, scenarios, then there will be trainings for teachers how to de develop their own already, uh, how to develop their own they can use to personalize it for your own content. Right now, we're using ones that partners have developed together. Oh, a visualization of different pathways you could take through an experiment, just to show it's not like streaming with one set level, but learners could skip between different pathways depending on how their learning needs appear as they interact with the AI-driven chatbot. Um, the workshops that I'm putting together, they're fairly modular to adapt to different local scenarios, what people want to cover. And there's ones coming up like in two days right here in uh, Sofia. The, other, the next one with a fixed date where it's like we've discussed the date, we've set it, the partners you know, we've put in places in Cuenca in Spain. Uh, so I'll be doing that one in Spanish, which, which will be a bit more challenging for me than English, but I like challenges. Uh, there should be ones, like I said, in uh, countries where we have partners. And hopefully in the new year, I'll be doing ones online and we'll target some other areas as well. Um, so with that, hopefully you got something interesting about the examples we covered, but hopefully you'll join us for AIM Low and for Discovery Space uh, workshops going on across Europe and online. Um, so with that, thank you for, uh, no? Do, do yes. Look at me like I'm saying something that's not the right thing. So. Um, Thank you for joining us. And hopefully a lot of you are on board for joining us more. We'll put the links into the chat once I finish talking and then like unshare the presentation. Uh, hopefully we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions still. Um, and if you don't get the links from the chat, either if I do a bad job copying them or like, you know, you just don't copy them somewhere, you'll also get them sent by email uh, from Scientix who will send that along with the participants participation certificates. Uh, so with that, I'll stop sharing the slides so I can put the links into the chat. And Kalina, do you have any final words? Well, uh, I would also like to say that if you have any questions about this, don't hesitate to contact us. Our emails are right there. <laughs> so yeah, we are available to help with uh, anything you want to know about this. And also, if uh, there are people who are more interested in the little tools that we have developed, if people uh, amongst you are into coding and want to develop those themselves, everything is <coughs> available for everyone. It's on GitHub. So if anyone wants to play with the tools, they're open for absolutely anyone who wants to, who wants to do that. And we're, we're, we're very much the same way with anything we develop, unless there's a partner on it who insists otherwise, anything that we make is free for anyone to use and do whatever they want with. Um, yeah. So it's, it's only in the small case that it comes up somewhere we're doing something where that might not be the case, but like if you want to train baby GPT, uh, if you want to I don't use overfit. I mean, it's just a couple of slides, but once the slides are online or if you're impatient, email us and we can send you the slides tonight. If yeah. you want anything like that. So yeah, if anyone wants the code for anything I showed, <clears throat> feel free to contact me and I'll give it to you. Perfect. And then thank you both of you for, for taking your time. I think this was a super interesting uh, training for everyone uh, to see and for me too. We, at least uh, we we learned definitely a new song in our uh, for those that might not be uh, familiar with. And, and it was really interesting uh, to see how, how you can train uh, train the programs, but uh, the programs will be, always need us, right? They cannot do uh, much if we don't uh, create them. Uh, so we do have a couple more minutes left and I just wanted to ask uh, if there are any questions. I see a lot of thank yous and I can also join. You really did an amazing job. Uh, and there's a cute author also saying that uh, she's proud of them. And da -da -da, I see also uh, uh, Mikhail asking if uh, we would be sharing the links by email. So what's going to happen after I close uh, this uh, webinar? 
we are going to uh, publish the recording on the Scientix uh, portal. You will have also the slides of the presentation there, so you won't miss anything. You will have again all the dates that Michael and Kalina just uh, mentioned and the links as well. Uh, the links will be in the email and all of you that have signed the signature list that I have shared in the chat uh, multiple times, you will also receive the certificate. So then I think we are all uh, set. So once again, really thank you for taking uh, your time and I see a lot of uh, positive uh, reviews in the in the chat. So uh, any last uh, comments from both of you? Any questions from anyone about what we said? Or if someone has a question afterwards, again, contact us. <laughs> well, and a, and a final reminder, if you found this interesting and you want more, there's more coming up yeah. uh, for free, like usual, <laughs> yeah. both online and in person, but like more of us together on AIMLO. Uh, and oh, I, I guess we didn't mention many specific things about it, but it's free. Um, it builds on previous sessions, but if you're just interested in one, most of them should be fairly easy to yeah. understand one on their own. We will be publishing recordings of them. We'll probably be a couple of days slow after doing it. Dep uh, I'll often have a terrible connection wherever I am to upload and download, um, but any things like that. Um, so hopefully, um, hopefully this isn't the end, but it's a beginning for some of you. And for those of you who it's an end, thanks for joining us this far. Perfect. Thank you both once again for joining and I wish a lovely evening to everyone here today. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.